All right, let's talk about shell money. <clears throat> it's a complicated topic, actually. Shell money is one of the most complicated topics I think I've tried to grapple with in money. Um, because it looks like commodity money. It looks like, you know, money made from some kind of like natural resource of some sort. But actually the dynamics are super complicated. Um, I was inspired to make this video um, as a tribute to David Graeber. Um, my last Substack piece, I wrote a tribute to David Graeber. And also decided to make this video free for everybody as opposed to um, only being for my paying Substack subscribers. So yeah, let's talk about shell money, shall we? Okay, so the reason why this is a Dispatches from the Frontiers of Modern Money video is that, well, this is actually a modern story. Um, in particular, I saw this story here, which was a Guardian article published a couple of weeks ago about the return of shell money in Papua New Guinea. Um, Papua New Guinea revives old ways of the COVID's blow to the economy. Now, in the last episode of the series, we're looking at the Tanaino wooden dollar, which actually was also similarly pitched as a kind of uh, response to COVID. So there's a whole sort of spate of these stories emerging right now, which are about alternative forms of money emerging as responses to economic crisis. Right? And this is a common theme that exists as um, it's been going on for a long time. And I talk about that in the last DFMM video. But there are some common themes that emerge when looking at these quite different uh, systems. In particular, when you're looking at like media stories about this, one of the immediate things that always happens is that the media always focuses upon tokens, right? Now, this is like a theme which I'm going to keep on recurring. Uh, it's going to keep on coming back in my videos is that um, in monetary systems, the most visible element of a monetary system is, well, the sort of surface level artifacts okay the kind of things that move around uh, and so in the case of our normal monetary system that's like cash tokens it might actually even be like the images you see on a computer screen when you're like looking at your internet bank account it might be like the cards that you hold there's all these various like surface level things that exist on, on the sort of like top layer of a money system as it were or like the kind of like visible layer of a money system um, and this is what we always focus on right and actually the media always focuses on focuses on this and they get really excited when there's some kind of like anomaly in the physical appearance or oh, the sort of physical the, the visible layer of a money system right so with the tonino wooden dollar story what they were fascinated by was the fact that this were voucher which is essentially it was a basically a voucher system is printed on wood Okay, so you got all these media guys going around, like, you know, filming the pieces of wood, being like, oh my God, it's some kind of like commodity money, you know. But in reality, <clears throat> uh, that's basically the same as, you know, imagine you had a Starbucks voucher and Starbucks decided to print it on, you know, a, a piece of vinyl, all right? Like, it's still a Starbucks voucher. Um, it just happens to have an unusual substrate that the, the token is printed upon, right? And that is what the Tanina Wooden Dollar story was about that I was looking at, right? It was a tertiary layer promise for a secondary layer bank uh, deposit, which is a promise for a primary layer state, um, uh, state money, okay? Now, in the case of something like the shell money that we're gonna look at, there was a similar media response, okay? So the media is like, oh my God, there's like shells that move around. Like, that's really fascinating, isn't it? Like shells. And also, it, it invokes something else in, in the kind of like, at least the sort of European or kind of like Western imagination, which is this kind of like shock at the idea that you can wander around and just like find money on the beach. You know, there's just like money just like scattered randomly. And you can like, there's a certain kind of like, you know, something like either like a moral horror or like some sense that it's like, something's like wrong about it or there's something like primitive about that there's all these various ways people like use to kind of 
um, imagine that. But it's harking into this, well, it's kind of like falling into this like much broader problem that people have when thinking about money, which is that they fall into commodity styles of thinking about money, basically. Um, assuming that somehow, like <clears throat> in the past of money, especially this, 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 this mentality people often imagine when they think about the history of money, th they're often thinking that like, well, especially in the past, like, like the, the body of the token is like super important. It's all about like what it's made about, what it's made of, right? Like this is like the most important part of like thinking about a money system. Okay. And I guess one of the biggest kind of points I'm trying to get across and, um, uh, in the series is that like, well, actually the body of the token is often the like least important element or it's like, not necessarily like, it's not an unimportant element, but it's but one element of when you think about monetary systems. Okay. And in some situations it's more important than others. Um, and in the case of the shell money, it's particularly complicated, right? It's particularly interesting. All right, one of the biggest points I want to initially make is the fact that shell money is not actually shells, okay? Like, you can't just like pick up the shell and use it as money, right? The actual token is a manufactured object, right? People have taken the shells and exerted all sorts of labor to turn them into these like elaborate long strings of shells. And there's like very specific uh, ceremonial or sorry, customary like rules for how you can do that. And the top side is being cut open here so that the string can be inserted from underneath to the top and then strung together into um, these things here. So that's how it's strung together. If you're really good, you can do it in one process, but Mesak is a bit useless, so. Okay, so there you go. Then you get another piece from the basket there, shell money, and you remove some ends from that one. And then you join it together, like so. Notice that the heads of the shell has to be in the same order. So can you point this out, please, Mesak, where the, where the head is? So that's it. That's the head. So of the two bits of shell money, they must be in in the same. They must lie on the same side, basically. All right. So pull it apart and pull the tip there together, and that basically locks the. Uh, the two bits of string together. Keep doing it like that. So this is how you finally wrap it up and get it ready for ceremonial purposes. This wrapping is made out of pandanus leaves and can last for up to 20 years in a dry condition. 100 years? No. 20 years, yes. <laughs> so there's a huge amount of labor that actually goes into the production of these uh, sort of almost like artistic jewelry-like objects, okay? Or sort of collections of objects turned into a kind of artistic um, ornamental form, okay? And this labor that's gone in um, creates a, I guess, like the, the feeling of, um, it, it, it contributes to the commodity imagination, right? Because when we're looking at commodity money, or what people imagine to be commodity money, 
one of the main things they imagine is around like a, the production process okay the fact that en energy goes into the the um bringing the token to life now actually when you're trying to understand the distinction between what are called commodity theories of money and credit theories of money there are often two conceptual um things that distinguish them okay the first is around this like um well money from something versus money from nothing okay so in the commodity imagination of money and i say like the, the commodity imagination of money so like there are like theories of money that around around that but there's also just like a general like imagination around money in the public more generally when people sort of like think about it as a commodity okay but in the commodity imagination sort of generally um there's this idea um that okay the the money is produced somehow okay so like you got to go and like like get some kind of raw material and then like make it into money okay so with people who get into gold they're really into this idea around like the sort of it's like money from something okay you like make the money right and then the sort of like the actual substance of the money the money token is what really really matters okay and the sort of second element of this is that this money from something um, basically just like trickles into circulation over time and just just sort of gets bigger but it like gets gets bigger at a kind of a slow rate because like people who are really into commodity money kind of like the idea that it's got a very sort of like predictable and kind of like um, at some point limited supply so for example gold you have to go and like find it slowly right and it slowly like trickles out into the world okay like this um, but there's this, so this idea that it basically it only expands but expands in a very sort of controlled way um, and then it just sort of like remains perpetually in the system it just kind of like floats about unless it gets lost all right like you know some ship sinks and then a whole bunch of gold is like lost in the bottom of the ocean for like scavengers to go and try and find but there's this whole idea that like basically it stays in circulation right now in credit there is a money you have this idea it's very different like you get like money from nothing all right because in credit theories of money you view money essentially as a um, accounting system um, to record obligations okay or well, actually it's like a redeemable um, accounting system so like yeah like you create tokens through accounting okay and then these tokens can be redeemed um, so you create essentially like credit records and you can pass these credit records around um, and they are redeemable credit records and like once you like i mean the most simple example to talk about is just like the straightforward voucher system right like a person issues it it moves around potentially and then you the person brings it back and it gets destroyed right it's like um a promise that's accounted for that can then move back and then it comes and then it sort of returns and it gets um removed from circulation right now you can actually like stick that promise um onto like any material you want hypothetically you could even stick it onto a piece of gold if you wanted to um or whatever like you could stick you could record it on anything any substrate okay so like the credit money form has a commodity body often but the, the sort of the commodity element of it takes a secondary uh, a sort of back seat as it were to the legal system in which the token circulates okay this is one of the big, big points i try to make in the last video which is that um well especially in like a straightforward credit money system like the legal system Will often activate the token so like the token by itself is only one part of the system okay there's a whole other structure that activates the token or brings it to life or like gives it meaning okay now if a commodity money theorist sees or when i say theorist, it's a commodity money enthusiast sees a credit money token they often say things like oh look it's just paper or it's like it's not real like da, 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 da. they make all these points about the body of the token right as if the body is the most important part right but in a credit theory or in a credit money system people are like well it doesn't matter i mean it's like a legal system so why do who, why do we care about the body okay now these general dynamics 
you got to be thinking about when you're looking at like people's political perspectives on money, but also just how the, the media approaches it. Um, but like going back to shell money, the complicated um, element of the story is that, okay, sure. When you're looking at the characteristics of the shell money, it does look like commodity money. Okay, so what's happening here is that like a, um, a group of people go in and they exert lots of labor. They uh, create these um, objects, these strings of shells. Okay, and uh, those strings of shells, once they enter circulation, are perpetual. All right, they just sort of like slowly the supply builds up and they move around as opposed to like a credit money system which they get issued and removed and they get removed from circulation issued destroyed issued destroyed okay so it looks a lot like commodity money the main problem we have though is the following when a person in a modern society is thinking about what money means they're imagining a very particular thing in their mind they're imagining general purpose access tokens to an economy okay or to a network of people they're imagining these, these general purpose things like i can take this and go and buy a coca-cola or i can take this and go and like i don't know book a skiing holiday or whatever it is that people want to want to do that with their with their things right or like in this room you know i can get a couch or like an old an old keyboard you know there's anything you, basically like that the access token or the sort of this token basically enables you to get anything um it's not it's not limited purpose okay um and this is something people think about and also there's very particular things you're not allowed to use those tokens for okay there's all these like taboos and stuff around what is appropriate to buy with money okay so for example if you piss somebody off like um let's say uh, your mother-in-law let's say you do her some grave um uh yeah you have some kind of grave insult where you sort of uh yeah all right and imagine then you just like whipped out a 20 dollar bill and was like Sorry, here, let me like compensate you for that injury or that insult by giving you this money. All right. Like that would be unheard of or like unthinkable for many people. Right. Actually, it would make the problem a lot worse if you tried to do that. If you try to sort of like pay your way out of something like that. OK. Now, when we're thinking about stuff like taboo shell money, it's actually very different. And this this issue goes beyond this particular form of there are like other forms of um, a sort of ceremonial money, which which anthropologists have long looked at, um, which basically are specially made for situations that basically like ordinary money would never be able to operate in. OK, to compensate people for injury, to invoke spirits, to like pay tribute to invisible forces. Um, uh, all sorts of like things to like um, show what uh, like sort of show like power. This was one of the few occasions that gave a glimpse into a Tolai ritual that involved the two bonds and the traditional cell money. While the practice may not appeal to many people in other parts of the country, the ceremony itself has religious and political meanings to the East New Britain people. Long before the establishment of modernized government systems, there were tubuans and tabu shell money. They were the government. They were the authority in the villages. Even there is a government today, the tubuans and the shell money still remain a significant form of authority that continue to exist amongst the East New Britain people. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. Another classic one is like bride price, okay, to basically um, compensate the family of somebody who's sort of like losing a daughter to your family, okay. And there's like tons and tons of anthropological work around this. So, for example, in the world of bride price, like um, 
people are not like buying a bride okay and often they're not allowed to at least in the past we're never allowed to use ordinary money to do this there were special things you could use for this process um albeit in modern times like uh sort of normal monetary systems have kind of come in and colonized this process but traditionally there were these special types of tokens people would use for these types of things okay now taboo shell money is very much like this okay its main use its main documented anthropological use historically well the main thing anthropologists documented about this um was it operates the vast the, the biggest amounts of it operate in these situations where basically ordinary money would never enter okay um so when we are you see any kind of account that's like oh you know in the history of money there was basically like in the beginning there was shells and like cowrie shells and this kind of stuff and then it became gold or whatever and then it became paper money and, da, 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 and then it became digital like this is like a very standard like presentation on the history of money just you must be like super super suspicious about that all right because a lot a lot of what these people are referring to as money actually explicitly had principles embedded in it that would never be fulfilled by modern day money okay um and it cannot just be seen as some kind of like crude version of our money it's actually often like kind of like more advanced in a way or operates in far more delicate settings okay so not only is the like production of these tokens like highly ritualistic uh, but the exchange processes are as well so like with normal money um you basically have it's like general purpose okay and often the exchange process is private okay so you can just like turn up anywhere and it just works and in different stores right but the and there's also these like market processes, these sort of uh, market forces going on, like supply and demand things, right? The prices can change and stuff. And people are like going in all these like bargaining processes occurring. Um, and with these uh, ceremonial money systems, often it's very different. Often they're very highly like public affairs. Okay. So check out this video here about that. This is uh, laying out the shell money and the payment of uh, the bride. This is being laid out by the um, family of the bridegroom. Okay, so you can see there's this whole kind of like ceremonial like laying out and this like mat on the floor. But then what's very interesting is that there's a whole sort of like secondary process whereby the family of the bride will like come forward to like ceremonially or sort of like performatively like inspect to see if it's okay. And they're gonna have to measure it. <laughs> So do you see how she kind of like made this like almost like comical performance of like sort of like rejecting it or something like that, right? This happens a lot in these types of processes. Um, there's lots of this stuff in like anthropology, which I, which I come from an anthropology background. It's like it's like full of, of this of accounts of how this works. OK, um, a lot of what's called exchange in pre-capitalist societies 
doesn't have it doesn't look like what you we would imagine exchange to be right this like sort of like private process it's often like highly like elaborate and like staged and almost like involves all these like um community processes okay and doesn't is not like subject often to avert supply and demand type of uh, um pricing dynamics as it were often there's like conventions for what the exchange ratios of things are there's all these kind of like, st like stuff that occurs like that right um so this like immediately um should throw any kind of doubt into your mind when you're hearing about like shell money and if you're trying to if you're thinking about it as being like the same as or like a crude version of what modern day money is it's like no it's actually almost like a parallel system that has different logics at play okay um and in particular i'm going to go into um what or at least one mode of analyzing this in anthropology, okay, which is what is referred to as fetish objects. So one point which I keep repeating, which which came up in the first video, is this like um, distinction between tokens and the system that activates the token. Okay. Um, now in a normal monetary system. Well, actually, let's say like a normal voucher system. Let's just make it a little bit easier. Um, there's explicitly just like a legal system that activates it. Okay. Um, now, in commodity thinking about money, um, it's like people who are really like into like thinking about like or want money to be a commodity. They often imagine that there isn't the system that activates a token. They often want to believe that. There is something like self apparent about the value of the token. All right. They'll say like anybody should be able to like walk up to it and just like naturally see that it is valuable. All right. There's no requirement for activation beyond that. OK. Now, like one of the really like interesting things, controversially, um, the main thing used in commodity theories to try and prove this is gold all right now i don't have time to go into this topic in this video but i would love to go into it in the future there is a strange assumption that gold is obviously valuable okay that there's like something self-apparent about it that's valuable now <laughs> this is a very very interesting topic um which i'll have to save for another time all right. But actually, even hardcore like commodity theorists of money like Adam Smith um, acknowledges this like in passing in the Wealth of Nations. Like I'm trying to remember the actual like um, land where he talks about this. Basically, he's talking about the Spanish conquistadors, right? He's talking about them in South America. OK, and they've rocked up there and these guys are there like you know, scraggly, desperate to find gold because like in the political economic field of Europe at that time, gold had been kind of like activated into this kind of like monetary form, right? But like in the context of South America, it wasn't, all right? Among the indigenous people there, it wasn't. It was like, okay, it's a sort of like, a slightly mystical beautiful thing but it's not the basis of an economy all right and these guys like these like desperate like probably quite poor spanish soldiers like rocking up in the in the jungle and they're like give us gold all right and it's like the people there are like geez these guys are crazy like they're prepared to like 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 exchange like it, like unreal amounts of things for this metal like something weird is going on here like why do they want this metal so much all right um it doesn't like warrant um the amount of like um energy all right well, what's going on actually is that the gold's been there's like some system in the background that's activating the power of that gold in the in the eyes of like the, like those spanish soldiers right to the point where they will like massacre people to get it 
Okay. Now, uh, so even these like apparently like obviously valuable commodity forms like gold are not obviously valuable to many people. Okay. Now, a very similar thing, you've got to think about this with any kind of like commodity money story. Um, now, it's true that there's no like legal system or there's no like credit money structure going on here with something like like shell money. Um, but there's definitely something activating it, right? Now, to understand this, like the way I, the, the, the most basic way I would normally talk about this is just to say like, there is a cultural field that's activating it, okay? Now, or a social field that's activating it. Actually, in that tribute piece I wrote to David Graeber, one of the, like, the basic points I was making about economic anthropology, which one of the things that distinguishes it from economics, is that economic anthropology always just starts with the assumption that people are are basically like not individuals like we're all essentially social creatures enmeshed in social networks right from the very beginning from the moment you're born like your entire world is defined by other people right they teach you language all right and that language that they teach you is like embedded with all sorts of assumptions and stuff like now you've got to try and like use that language to think about the world all right and form your own thoughts but it's like full of the assumptions of other people like Every tool you use is basically constructed by other people. All right. So all this like weird, like abstract notion of like the individual, which is like super important in economics is like really, it's like a later concept that emerges, right? It's sort of like a kind of abstract ideological concept that emerges later in people's lives. Okay. Um, but most people know that they're part of cultural social fields right you constantly like feel that and you're part of like multiple of these fields right um right now i'm sitting in brighton um in my friend's house he lent me this place um to, i'm house sitting at his spot um, i'm already part of like so many fields here like one i'm like in like this friendship field with him okay there's certain things i'm aware of that i can't like do in this place or i can do in this place all right there's like outside this house here this fields like in, in brighton like there's like like a certain vibe to the city there's like ways people interact with each other there's like norms and stuff there's like the broader uk there's like so many of these things going on right um different sort of like circles you're part of and we all experience these fields all the time right and like um they're tangible okay and also like they activate things they make certain things important now a simple super simple example i'll give you in this house is like down there um is an object okay and my friend he said to me uh he's a very laid back guy right he just said to me he's like hey Brett, you can do whatever you want in my house all right but there's one thing you can't do. He's like, please don't touch that object, okay? Or he's like, he's like, please don't like, just be very careful with that object, please, okay? The reason why is it's been passed down by his, his granddad, right? And it has a lot of sentimental value, all right? Now to somebody who didn't know that, they might just see it and it's like, oh, well, it's just like another object, right? But like to him within his family context, it's not just an object. It's like got a whole world of meaning to it, right? Um, and like we all have this, right? We all have objects that have these like um, intense meaning to us. And um, this meaning can actually be generated between like even like two people. You often have like couples who will have little like objects that mean things between them, right? There's like a small, a small like social field that's generated between those two people. And within that, they can have their own like language and little symbols that they use and so on. But these fields get very big, right? And um, anthropologists often tend to be looking at these like quite, you know, sort of like big ones, which are like um, between whole sort of like groups of people. Okay. Um, and these cultural fields are almost like force fields. Okay. Like to somebody who's coming, who's looking from the outside, they might see stuff going on. They might see like objects being passed around, but they're just like, oh, that's like silly. So imagine, for example, like um, a German colonial authority, because um, actually Papua New Guinea, where this where this shell money comes from, um, basically like it was it was colonized by the Dutch, the Germans, the British, um, then the Australians kind of took it over. Um, 
imagine they like they like see these objects being passed around and they're like ha, oh, these silly these silly natives they're like passing shells around and they think it's money ha oh, you know it's like this is literally like a person who's like outside of the cultural field looking in trying to interpret what's going on from a completely different like worldview and not being able to understand okay it's much like you know in a small example in this in this room you know if somebody didn't know they're just like oh yeah but that's you know it's just an object that's so why it's like that's not important right um and um yeah now in anthropology there's a there's a concept which is called fetishism which is one of the ways we use to describe this okay where uh, basically certain objects are turned into being more than objects okay through the cultural field and in particular there's a reason why that happens okay um, now one of the reasons is that like like hey even in a like a like small social settings are confusing okay but imagine now like you have like I don't know 400 people 4,000 people um, and these like whole groups of people, the social relationship starts to get very like complex and tense, okay? Um, and they're often also very hard to see, all right? So often what people will do, <clears throat> there's a tendency for people to kind of like project uh, those relationships that which are often like semi-invisible and amorphous into very concrete and visible objects. Okay, now there's like loads and loads of uses of this of this process. For example, like peace treaties. Have you ever seen how people will like create like an object to represent the peace treaty? Okay, this is like a very well known thing. And like, um, for example, like wampum beads in North America. Um, one of the big sort of uses was to be like physical embodiments of say like a peace treaty. Okay, you like literally like take a peace treaty, which is basically an agreement between groups of people who write, they're like got a bunch of like disagreements and stuff. And you like concretize it into an object and you say like, oh, here is the peace treaty. Okay, it's like in this object somehow. Okay, people like kind of know that it's not. But, you know, for example, if that peace broke down, you might like chuck that object away, right, as a sort of like or like ritualistically destroyed potentially potentially or something like that like you can you can sort of like manipulate these objects as a way to sort of um deal with the relationships going on um uh, but one of the basic points is that those fetish items or those fetish tokens or fetish uh objects sorry um are only activated in a particular cultural setting where they're seen as being that thing, okay? Outside of that setting, they're just seen as being like, say like jewelry or something, which is like literally what colonists would tend to think the stuff was. They're like, oh, it's just like pretty shells and things, right? Okay, they wouldn't understand that fetishization process. So like, check out this video here, which is um, super, super interesting because like one of the um, uh, things they show uh, shell money being used for is the ceremony around um, uh, essentially forgiving Japan, okay, for um, wrongs done during the Japanese, during the, the world wars when Japan came and occupied the island, okay, and there's like this section over here, check this out. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I stand on behalf of the churches in this new prison. Japan, we forgive you. So that's a, a very like concrete example of these like sort of political tokens, as it were, um, being used in a almost like existential ritual because it's not like you can like. Um, uh, kind of repay the the sort of existential debt of invading somebody or occupying their lands really right it's not people know that you can't just like buy it you buy your way out of it right 
But there's something about these fetish objects which are important ritualistically or they're like symbolically um, uh, have this have this ability to sort of mediate these relationships. Um, also, like another super important thing to bear in mind when looking at the um, ritualistic production processes that go into these these shell money. Um, one of the reasons why the cultural field will activate them into these kind of like fetish like power tokens is related to the fact that all this labor has been put into them. OK, like there's something about the, rit the ritualistic production process, which is is involved in the overall like psychology of it. Right. Because um, like, for example, imagine if some opportunistic entrepreneur was like, oh, well, like these tokens seem to do, do this stuff in this place. What I'm going to do is just like artificially synthesize uh, the shell, the shells out of like some kind of, you know, acrylic uh, or something and then just automate the process by which they're made. Right. And then I'm going to like deploy them into that setting and they're going to work. It's like, no, that's not going to happen. Right. The cultural field will reject those. It will not work. OK. Um, and as an aside, uh, I know that people like in the Bitcoin community, for example, are really prone to believing. Um, well, if they if they saw this, if they saw all this like labor being put into the production of these of these tokens, they'd probably say something like, oh, this is a little bit similar to the, the Bitcoin production process. Right. Like, like the tokens are like secured by the fact there's always energy being put into them. Um, but actually, it's very, very different, right? The, the Bitcoin system is designed to make a general purpose uh, capitalist money, and it's highly impersonal and highly automated, the process, right? OK, whereas this is a highly personal form of labor. All right. You don't get to outsource it to some kind of like factory somewhere far away. Um, and if you did try to do it, it would degrade the meaning. OK. Um, and also, once it's created, the cultural field is that makes it do certain things only, right? You can't just like rock up, you know, make yourself some shell money and then go down to the store and buy a Coca-Cola. OK, it doesn't work like that, right? There has to be these very specific processes for its creation and then very specific processes for what it's then used for. OK, incidentally, as an aside, for those who are interested in a bit of political economy geekery um karl marx sort of took um anthropological insights about fetishism and these fetish objects talk about what he referred to as commodity fetishism okay which is like quite a it's a related but different concept now in the world of like marxist commodity fetishism it it's like you know, if you're like walking around the supermarket and you just see these like random objects floating everywhere, all right? You're just like, oh, washing powder, um, I don't know, Coca Cola, da, 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 all these things, just like they float there and you just see these objects, right? Um, and then you're paying for these objects. And in your mind, you believe that like what you're doing is buying objects, okay? And like this is, this is what you think that the economy is. This is like the, 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 the buying of objects, okay? Um, Marx's point there is that like, no, you're not buying objects. You're essentially buying labor power, right? Like somebody produced those objects, okay? Um, and you've come to believe that the, like, like, the, like everything is in the object, okay? So like you, this is where the sort of like the fetishism concept comes in, is that there's like, there's invisible social relationships somewhere, okay? And you are like fixating on the results, which is this like thing that's been produced out of like a factory probably somewhere. OK, and then you're going to move this around. And in so doing, like a whole bunch of stuff is happening in the background. OK, like a whole bunch of processes are going on. But all that you can see is the object. OK, so you fixate on the objects. I don't know. That's like, that's not just like the best description of commodity fetishism. But the basic idea is that the object is actually obscuring social relations and often at least in the Marxist framework, it's uh, disguising exploitation. OK, so you actually um, well, one of the classic things in like Marxist thought is that like 
the person who goes into a factory to uh, as one day to like to be a worker like sits and slaves away and like has to make this stuff and then gets paid like only a small amount of what its actual sale price is all right and then they all like go into the market the next day to be the person who buys the thing that's being produced by people like themselves okay and then they see the object and they think that they're like yeah i'm, I'm like sitting in the factory to make money to buy the objects and it's like yeah but you're the one producing the objects that you're buying okay and then like you're basically being screwed in the process like this is like a very crude description of like marxist commodity fetishism um but like this whole idea is that there's some like human relationships going on in the background um and then objects that are distracting you okay now in sort of um uh, the more the more anthropological use of the term has a more positive connotation in the sense that the ideal as in the case of this like taboo shell money like like ceremony as i call it like um uh, is supposed to try and actually like mediate relationships in a positive way to take tense situations that would otherwise be quite hard to deal with um and to try and use these objects as a sort of like metaphorical way to deal with them okay now that's kind of like an abstract thing but you see that in that that video with the like the, the japanese guys like handing out the like shell money to the to the people sitting there as some kind of like sort of you know gesture of, of dealing with this like otherwise highly intangible like process of like guilt and like violence and 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 so on um so yeah these concepts are related okay um, but of course, in the case of like Karl Marx, like the world that he is seeing there is the result of normal money, not stuff like ceremony. Okay, which is a whole like new layer of irony. All right, let's try and get into the uh, amb ambiguity now. Okay, now even in the original anthropological accounts of ceremony, this shell money, like it is acknowledged that actually. While most of it is used for these type of like fetishistic um, sort of ritualistic forms of exchange, there is a portion of it that's just used for like everyday commerce. Okay. Um, in the uh, piece that accompanies this video, I've written about this guy, uh, Salisbury, who's an Canadian anthropologist who went and documented all the kind of like, he did a whole bunch of like detailed ethnography on like, the different sort of like prices for things using shell money and it's like quite interesting stuff i went and read through all of it um and there's just in general there's there's a debate in anthropology about like okay we do acknowledge that these tokens are some kind of like fetishistic power token which is different to normal money okay but there's a zone of ambiguity there's a zone where actually these things do start to get used for like everyday purposes. Okay. So almost like there's like the high ritualistic use and then a the kind of like low commercial use of some sort. I mean, you have the, that's like, um, one way of putting it. Right. Um, and, uh, this distinction is important because the, like any like ec economists, like the way they want to think all the time is that like, well, the only like logic in the world is like the kind of like straightforward commercial logic, right? There is no other logic. Um, so it is important to make this distinction, but it's also like risky to make it as if there is no like interstitial boundary between these things. Like we don't experience the world as being um, split into like different disciplines, right? Like I'm not like operating in an economics world in one day and then like suddenly like in a political world i mean all these things for us are like seek into one like in, like a uh, field of experience okay so um economists are trying to describe the shell money by one very particular type of logic and certain types of anthropologists might try to describe it by a very different type of logic but in reality there's going to be this kind of like um, for the for the everyday person, a whole kind of like um, sort of zone of blending, okay, and this is what becomes very hard to to, to write about because um, especially if you're used to no ordinary money, um, you're not going to quite know when one or the other is happening, okay. Now, Salisbury went around and he documented all this stuff about the fact that actually like people were using shell money um, for 
some ordinary commercial pur purchases too. And this is this continues to this day, okay? Um, but the most confusing thing about this is that, uh, and this is where we get into the dark history of anthropology, because I love anthropology, right? But like one of the big problems in anthropology is, well, believe it or not, it emerged in the, the era of colonization, okay? So anthropologists often arrived in places when colonization was going on, okay? Or had already been going on for quite some time, okay? They then observe these societies. Now, of course, what they observe is going to be very different to the world that they come from, okay? So indeed, to the eyes of like an anthropologist who's just arrived from like London or something, they're going to see a very exotic society, okay? Now, what they're going to imagine if they're a like more crude anthropologist, they're going to be like, oh, this is like some like totally far out, like amazing, like, you know, like a tribe that stayed the same for all time. And I'm suddenly seeing this amazing stuff. Right. But in reality, actually, of course, the the exoticism is to, is to do with the fact that it's, it's like a new thing that they haven't seen. Right. But actually, um, what they might be seeing might be very different from the situation that existed a hundred years before, all right? So if you arrive in Papua New Guinea in 1900, it's not necessarily the Papua New Guinea that was around in, you know, 1700s before the economists arrived, okay? So, um, and that means that like rituals you observe could have been influenced and altered by the colonial presence, okay? So like, um, when this guy Salisbury, which I write about in the piece, like he, when he arrives there, like the, he's talking about all these like sort of this blending of these like political logics and economic logics that are going on and the, the use of these ta the taboo shell money. Um, and one of the hardest things for us to kind of like pass out is like, w was he observing um, a sort of dynamics that w had been induced by the presence of colonial powers basically right because by this time by the time he was writing um and i'll you know, put links for that but like there was essentially um colonial money systems external money systems have you had been put into place right so there was like there'd been the english currency there was now the australian currency was now circulating around okay so and there's all this sort of like um, dual systems emerging okay so i use this concept of like syncretic money system like syncretic is a term you find in anthropology quite a lot which means like where two cultural fields meet you find these kind of like hybrid forms emerging okay so um syncretic religions the most well-known version of this like so you'll find these very strange uh combinations between christianity and like animist beliefs so like in Papua new guinea where he's looking there's basically like these um uh people are technically christian but they're also like worshiping like cult spirits at the same time okay and so like the taboo you'll have these like priests who are like using it to like invoke spirits from like cult members okay so this is like a syncretic religious system so you got like syncretic religion uh but you also got like a syncretic economy so you got like subsistence farming which is the original thing but now you also have cash cropping which is a sort of like a euphemism often used basically to mean like um systems whereby like colonized people were basically like ended up having to like produce various like commodity crops to be sold via like colonial traders into the global markets okay um so he arrives in this time when basically like, there's already like the international capitalist system is like seeping into Papua New Guinea okay and he then like is observing the fact that like the taboo shell money system has got these like commercial logics in it as well, okay? And the question we have to start asking ourselves in this context is like, okay, well, were these commercial logics like, did they really exist like in in like older times or were they basically the, the result of the fact that people are being drawn into like market systems? One of the terrible things that's happened in, in, in modern economics, and this is what I, I wrote about in my, my tribute to David Graeber, is that like modern economics is often specialized in sort of like sanitizing the history of money okay it sort of just talks about it as like oh yeah money's just like it's like, like it's always defined by like vague functions it's like oh it's just this like medium of exchange and stuff it's like 
nobody ever talks about like like the actual like process of how monetary systems are put in place okay like literally speaking a guy rocks up in your village okay if you're a colonized person and says hey like you have to give us these tokens all right and the person's like well where am i gonna get the tokens from it's like well you got to work in a mine to get the tokens to pay us the tax okay it's like literally how some like monetary systems are, are established or like like you you like force people to take the tokens okay and like you basically have the pro the, the, in, in colonial processes this has always been a key element of how you basically absorb people into your network okay is you get them to use your monetary system by demanding taxation from them in that money okay and even like progressive monetary movements to this day like mmt or like um modern monetary theory this is like a, a core um, foundation of the thought right is the basic the idea that like these money monetary systems are political systems all right um, backed by legal systems and in the case of colonialism um, uh, this is pure military force right like you rock up somewhere and you like demand that people who haven't used these systems before pay you in these systems okay and that's how you extend that logic into those places and you sort of subsume people as kind of like subservient, like second tier parts of that economy um, by doing that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, this is like one of the big problems when not just the depoliticized accounts of money that you find in economics, right? It's completely like doesn't talk about this process. Okay. Um, so like when we're looking at Papua New Guinea in the 1960s and there's like this guy talking about... Um, or how taboo is used in various ways. Um, well, this has been in the context where this has all been going on, right? So yeah, check out this guy speaking about the colonial history. The time we play stuff now. We come now, we come now, we come now, we come now. Snap the tail on. Snap the tail on. Snap the tail on. Snap the tail on. Now you can check out my article um, on that accompanies this for some like more details on this. Um, but one of the like core uh, concepts you got to try and like uh, grapple with in these like, like politics of money, the colonial politics of money, is that there is like a if you, if your objective is to absorb people into your like network which is what like colonists wanted to do right they wanted to come somewhere and say like we want you to start becoming like wage laborers or to like produce stuff and plantations for us um so that we can like take it and resell it for like a like a massive profit on profit on global markets okay and like give you like a very small amount in return okay um you either have to find a way to like corrupt the internal structure of those people's world or you got to like do it from the outside. Okay, so like um, one of the first thing that colonial officials always do is they kind of like uh, look for things that look vaguely similar to something that they're used to that they can kind of co-opt almost like a Trojan horse. So, so for example, if you see like taboo shell money being used for like ceremonial purposes to a colonial official through their lens, they're like, Oh, it sort of look, vaguely looks a little bit like money, doesn't it, right? 
um, well, I could actually like start just like telling people that it's money. They must like, treat it as money. And like also I can ask for taxation and that kind of stuff, right? Like this explicitly happened in the case of wampum shells in or like wampum um, uh, like currency, sometimes called um, in North America, right? We can, uh, I can do more stuff about that, but like explicitly like our colonists would go in and just start treating it as money just like speaking about it as if it were and like offering it and like sort of like acting that out all right um or coercively demanding it like in in, in, in that context and that slowly like shifted how the the it was seen in in the eyes of like native american people right now similar thing could be going on with taboo here like you have this a colonial force coming from the outside and they start speaking about your internal currency as being a certain kind of thing or your internal like um, fetish objects as being actually just like pretty much the same as our like capitalist money, okay? And all the sort of power dynamics start to seep across these boundaries, okay? And the other thing you can simultaneously do is you you basically want to try and create all these bridges between your currency network and this other token network. Okay, so they'll establish exchange rates. They'll say they'll say like, oh well, like your thing is worth this much in our tokens. Okay, and um, by the way, like our network's way more powerful than yours. Okay, so like um, our network enables access to all these like international goods your parochial little like local network is um like shitty and it's weak and it's shameful as well and um you should start to basically like see your tokens as being um subservient to ours all right and this is going to be what we can pay you for your tokens and you can kind of like create these processes where you create this bridge between this powerful network or this powerful cultural field and these weaker ones right and this is what's you know this is like a very high level quite crude description of what's going on in colonization processes but this is what creates those syncretic systems right this is why for example you'll have people who are like halfway between christianity and like animist religions because they're like well shit like um you know like my own religion is like degraded by these guys coming in so i'm like now nah, i'm a christian but i was just like on the side like i do some like you know um of my own stuff and then we like you know like this is why often they often like in these religions they'll get really into like christian saints because like the saints in christianity can sort of look a little bit like um animist deities often so there'll be this whole like world of like sort of like ambiguity but basically that they're taking on a, a more dominant like sort of colonial form and trying to blend it but often a, in a subservient position um so there's a similar thing potentially going on with this with this shell money which is like you've got these like much more powerful currency network coming in from the outside and then people um have this zone of blending between their own tokens these like ceremonial ceremony tokens which are like these fetish objects and this like pure commercial capitalist money, which basically is used to, they get paid in that to like provide like cash crops and then in return they can buy like tinned fish, something like that, okay. Um, so this is what makes the current story put out the, by The Guardian, this one here, so complicated. <laughs> so this journalist, I mean, they're just saying like okay well we see there's there's like normal money and then there's this like a strange shell stuff and people have like revived the shells to like um use in the time of covid right so like this brings it back to our, our you know frontiers of modern money the fact that like okay so in the context of the covid pandemic suddenly the shell tokens are taking on increased importance like what's going on here okay so with all that stuff that i've been saying in the background how do we analyze this story? Like what's what's happening? Okay. Well, like I've got a basic like intuition about what's happening, okay? Which is basically that and they that's it's mentioned in this story. The cash distribution system has broken down in Papua New Guinea as a result of COVID-19. Okay. So cash distribution, if you look at all my like other videos and some of my videos on YouTube and stuff, like 
in normal monetary systems, there's two parts to the state money system, right? And one part to the bank money system, which I'm not going to go into the details here, but like one part of the state money system is the cash tokens, which are the physical tokens, the physical incarnation of state money. Okay. Now, historically, especially in like co colonial settings, like cash is always the most dominant form, right? Cash, this is one of the reasons why a lot of my work on the war on cash, I try to protect the cash system because it's like, um, it is a form of money which enables people to have more autonomy than tradition, like, like digital forms of state money and digital forms of bank money. Okay, so like commercial bank money. Um, but in the context of Papua New Guinea, of course, like the cash system is the colonial system. Okay. Um, and historically, like, uh, you know, in the sort of pre-capitalist mode of being, these this, these like strange physical money tokens from like like uh, nation states would have been seen as like really bizarre, right? Of course, but nowadays this has be, it's been integrated into the society um, as people have been sucked into the global markets. Um, but the cash distribution system in a in a place like Papua New Guinea is probably quite uh, fragile. Okay, so you actually have to like physically get the cash tokens around to people. Okay, and this is a big issue in like cash politics more generally is around the distribution processes, right? But something's happened to disrupt the distribution process. Now, what's then occurred is that well, you already have this like dual um, process in place, um, but uh suddenly the taboo have taken on a new meaning in this context now there's one last dark piece of the puzzle to put in before before um this finally makes sense which is let me show you this this video here um made by the world bank none other than the world bank okay with the support of the World Bank, these women entrepreneurs are being listed and presented in widely accessible databases, which is the first step for them to get out of their backyard factory and onto the screens of merchants. We hope that even the Europeans might be interested in the shell money that we are making and marketing here. And the simple effort to broaden the sales base has the potential to create additional spending that trickles down. If you should find shell money for sale on the internet, remember, it has come a long way. It might have come via Martha, Hamily, Jowlin and Lena, the raw material delivered via canoe overnight. And since it is unlikely that you will ever meet them, they are thankful for your purchase. All right, so basically <laughs> the World Bank, in all its wisdom, um, has been telling people, hey, you should be selling your taboo shell money for normal money on the international markets. Now, bear in mind the mentality of the World Bank um, and how all these types of institutions think um, is basically being like, what is good? is to take people and integrate them into global globalized capitalist markets so that they can earn money to buy things from those same markets okay so the pre-capitalist version or the pre-globalized capitalist version is like you can be a subsistence uh, farmer and make enough to survive and basically not have to enter markets right you can be part of these these traditional communities in this sort of transnational capitalist world it's like you better find something to sell into international markets so that you can buy the stuff from international markets. Okay, in this case, like tinned goods. Okay, and um, the super dark side to this is that actually the like integration into, into those global markets um, is being linked in this by this other person, which I'll show you now, to like increases in diabetes. Diabetes, hypertension. Uh, cancer, uh, heart diseases. People who make a lot of garden, they, they go to the market, they sell their, their, their product, garden product in the market. Instead of themselves eating those products, they sell them to get money to buy canned food or to buy frozen food. Previously, diabetes never, never affected us that much. 
but recently because of there is a lot of uh, change in the lifestyle uh, the diabetes is becoming uh, an alarming problem in, in East New Britain and Papua New Guinea as a whole. People who have uh, diabetes and high blood pressure especially must have money, must have money to come for a uh, checkup and to get resupply with drugs. One, one thing that they do is they have to change the traditional money which we call shell money or taboo we have to they have to change it into into money in order for them to come forward for checkup okay but the basic point that's going on is that like the world bank is going there being like hey you should like sell your shell money for money okay um because it's a tourist trinket and people can would like to buy it right on amazon for example so this is going beyond that kind of like colonial setting i spoke about so the colonial thing was like okay we're gonna like corrupt the internal structure of your network by like co-opting your taboo shell money in various ways and we're also gonna like fuse it to our money through these like bonding points Okay, so we'll have like you're gonna have your, your network here. We're gonna have our network, and we're gonna like slowly corrupt it, corrupt and warp your network. Okay, and make you subservient to ours. Okay, whereas the World Bank is going even further here. They're saying like, we're, we're gonna like, we want you to like, like take the tokens out of your network and like sell them into the international ones, and exchange in exchange for like transnational money systems, basically. All right. So we're going to like rip the tokens out of your network. Okay. Interestingly, this is the same problem that was going on in, um, albeit on a much like smaller scale in the Tenino wooden money story I talked about with the collectors. So they were trying to keep, get these like, like vouchers to stay in a particular area and collectors from outside the area kept them trying to like rip them out. Okay. Um, check out that video if you want to get that, the details on that. So there's this process whereby basically the, the shell money is being turned into an object on a capitalist market that's priced in like dollars, okay? Now, finally returning to this like Guardian story. Um, so in the context where the cash distribution system for the ordinary fiat money in, in uh, Papua New Guinea breaks down, suddenly you have these commoditized taboo shell um, tokens, which have been had a, a sort of fiat currency price established. Um, suddenly, like there's an, like the Guardian notes, like a resurgence of these to be used for everyday commerce. It's like, well, okay, well, what's probably going on here is what's called counter trade. Okay, this is the final concept I'll, I'll deal with here. Now, counter trade is like, a super important concept for anybody who's interested in trying to understand monetary dynamics. Um, counter trade actually um, is one of the tools used by credit theorists of money to um, destabilize commodity theories of money. Like originally, one of the, the first times I've seen it used was by Alfred Mitchell Innes who's this guy writing in the 19, uh, like 1913, 1940. He raised like famous, like, like seminal pieces of money, basically, right? And he was dismantling Adam Smith's stories of money, right? And uh, Adam Smith was convinced that people were using like cod and stuff like, as commodity money to like buy stuff. And Alfred M Mitchell Innes was like, it's counter trade, okay? And he wasn't the only one. There's like other people, other people, other people who... who, who uh, brought this up but like basically counter trade means like you have two monetary transactions that are superimposed over each other and um, a monetary transaction has a money leg and a goods leg okay so you but it's always double ways right if you put two of those together you sort of have four legs in total and you can like cancel out the money legs okay so you have this like um you superimpose two monetary transactions and the money legs cancel out and it looks like there's just two objects moving okay so for example there's a money price for cod and then there's a money price for something else okay 
and in the context where for some reason the, the money is not available, you can just take those two prices in your head and work out the theoretical exchange ratio um, by using the two money prices. And then you can say, oh, well, I'll give you this much card for this much thing. It then superficially looks like it's barter because like to an untrained eye, it's like, oh, you're giving this good for this thing. It's like barter basically, right? But actually it's two money transactions superimposed with the money leg canceled out. Now let's go back to Tabu. Now, um, through various like mechanisms, uh, there is a money price for those Tabu shells. Okay. And there's money price for things like tinned goods. Okay. And now suddenly the cash distribution system's broken down. So what do you have? You have counter trade. Okay. Um, where uh, suddenly this ob one object moves in um, a particular ratio to another object. Now, what makes the story more confusing than that one I mentioned about um, Adam Smith is that in the context of the Adam Smith story, they were he was talking about like dried cod, like something like that, right? And Alfred Mitchell Innes was just like, no, nah, this is like, you know, you got, you got counter trade going on. But in the case of this here, yeah, we're talking about some kind of like a token that has historically had some form of like ordinary commercial money use, but mostly used with like existential things that money can't buy. Okay. Um, and this is what makes it a so much more like complicated story. Um, and, uh, but what we can definitely say is that like the, um, that, uh, the original version of it that you would have found in the, like, let's say the 1700s or whenever, um, would have been far less commoditized than it is nowadays. And there wouldn't have been an external monetary price for it. Okay. There wouldn't have been an external currency, which the tokens were being priced in. So it, it's possible that there was an internal logic in those communities where there was actually an exchange ratio for something like taboo shells for rice or not in those, in those days probably not rice but say like um uh i don't know yams or whatever the particular local uh, uh crop is um but in modern day times a much more powerful currency network has come in and, and like established a real like market money price for these um and that's probably what's dominating now in the logic okay um maybe this is like the final final thing i'll say about this is um, these tokens nevertheless um, have will have a certain type of like double life okay and actually if you're thinking about like c colonial situations more generally this is this is a very important thing right like so in South Africa where I come from obviously has a very intense colonial history right now for the, the many people in South Africa you know I grew up in a Zulu area um, and for the Zulu people, sure, they were often, you know, forced or like co-opted into like these like uh, mining systems to like produce like uh, commodities, which would then be sold into international markets. OK, um, but and that would be their like, you know, day job of like a, a Zulu laborer, for example, during the apartheid era. Right. would be doing that. But on the weekends and in the evenings, there was like a separate cultural zone they could escape to that was kind of like their own thing, all right? Um, and for many colonial, colonized people, this is the case, right? You have like your day, your day existence, which is like, I'm just like a person subsumed into a bigger system, which I have no control over. And then you hold on to these little outposts, which are your own thing, right? Your own little lang language or your own little like, like thing in this glo vast global world that doesn't really care about your, about your, um, uh, the particularities of, of, of your cultural field. And it's a similar thing with these taboo shells, right? There actually is still a cultural power that they have. It, it is still a, a cultural field that exists there and they still have forms of like, if you had to imagine these tokens as being like entities, they'd still have like pride and they still have forms of um, power that only they have, right? But as it were, like their day job is to be increasingly, they've been kind of co-opted into, into these um, international networks as just sort of like commodity-like objects that have like money prices. Okay. Um, anyway, check out the article if you 
want to go more into that and see more of the links and stuff. Um, one little teaser I'll give you about some future stuff um, to build on this is that, um, well, by the way, one, Bitcoin tokens also use counter trade, which I've been discussing there. Counter trade is a key element of how Bitcoin pricing works. Okay. Two, um, in a lot of like modern forums and stuff, when people are talking about forms of money like taboo shells and stuff like this, and they're often using this like, um, and this is something I touch on in the, the David Graeber tribute piece. They're using like a post um, or a modern like capitalist money way of thinking to think about um, uh, tokens that didn't ever exist in that context originally. Okay, so there's a lot of like abuse of these uh, these these um, systems so if particularly for example um, check out the Bank of England what is money site here you know they do this like uh, standard thing of like sticking uh, you know fiat money right next to like cowrie shells as if they're basically in some kind of chain of progress roughly the same thing except the cowrie shells are like a crude version of what we have okay and so they're presenting it like in this way it's like whereas like actually there's, there's separate logics and there's like parallel histories okay um but actually people like the you know in like say the bitcoin community also have done this for example trying to compare their systems to like the rye stones of the island of yap there was like a ton of this stuff happening like a few years ago all these like crypto people are writing like blog posts about yap right and they're like oh like the stones like the stone money and they had all this whole thing and it's like basically just like abusing systems that they don't understand okay um and trying to co-opt them into modern narratives about money okay now you gotta be super careful about this colonizing tendency the way people try to like pull in these systems into like modern ways of thinking um and just to like finally conclude this um for like the fifth time <laughs> Uh, this is one of the big things that David Graeber was working on. And that's why I wrote that tribute, the tribute piece. He was like one of the key people in dismantling barter theories of money, which barter theories of money are like basically exactly what I just said. People taking like modern way, modern like uh, uh, mentalities forged in the context of capitalist money systems and then trying to like project them backwards in time and to imagine worlds like these pre-capitalist worlds as if they operated on the same logics. Um, and that's what he, that David was working on and, and explicitly about trying to like politicize um, the, the accounts of the past of money, um, the descriptions of the present um, of money and the visions of the future, futures of, future of money. Um, and with that, I will close and um yeah rest in peace david graeber cheers guys <laughs>